Welcome to Inside Healthcare. As we start this new year, COVID cases are averaging a record 700,000 cases a day in this country. For the very latest on the pandemic, we go to the front lines and we talk with Dr. Will Nicholson at M Health Fairview. First of all, I just want to start by saying thank you for inviting me, Jody. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time working in our hospitals, person to person with patients and with our healthcare teams, but it's not often that I get a chance to address our broader community. And I, you know, I'm incredibly proud uh, to be someone who delivers healthcare uh, in the community I grew up in. And I'm also exceedingly proud to represent the, the folks at, at our hospitals uh, on this important topic. And I, I want to make sure that <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the people that have stepped up to meet the healthcare needs uh, of, of this, uh, this pandemic get a shout out from me. And also I wanna make sure that we start with the most important message uh, you know, from myself and from everybody at, at our hospitals. And that is, we need your help. Uh, we need to stop spreading COVID. And we have all the tools we need to do it. And I'm, I'm happy to you know, talk about some of the details with you, but boy, Omicron is, is a huge challenge to our communities. We want to stand up and meet that challenge, but we cannot do it without broad community support. And our community has always been there for us. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to be reaching out to you guys again. That's really good advice. So Omicron, I mean, how is, some are saying it's less severe than the Delta variant and stuff. What are the most common symptoms that you're seeing with this? You know, the challenge is that Omicron can present in lots of different ways. And so when you look at a a study that averages out the impact in, in a community, you know, what it doesn't show, uh, if, you, if you say, well, on average, it's, it's uh, not as bad as it, it doesn't show uh, that it is much more transmissible. And so we're seeing a much higher spike in the cases. Uh, and it also doesn't show individual uh, outcomes. So it may be that one person has a mild case or is asymptomatic, uh, but another person can still be sickened, uh, critically ill or, or die. Uh, and, and when you have so many cases coming the way that we see it uh, spreading across the, the globe, really, um, you know, the pandemic itself is not less severe. The infection on an individual level may be, uh, but the challenge to our communities and our hospitals is bigger than it's ever been. And, and in fact, one of the biggest concerns we have is how fast it's spreading in unvaccinated children. Uh, you know, our children are pretty important to us. And uh, you know, up until now, they've been relatively safe, uh, but we're dealing with a level of illness in kids that's that's really startling. And uh, you know, we got to do everything we can to keep them safe and healthy, especially because so many can't get get immunized and get protected. So, if someone is developing symptoms or they test positive, what should they be doing to um, protect themselves and their family? I mean, it goes back to you know, don't spread the disease. Stay home, isolate yourself, um, and then and then get tested. And there are you know great guidelines from the CDC, uh, Department of Health. Uh, if you search their websites, uh, Fairview has a great website. Uh, it's uh, what is it? Fairview or mhealthfairview.org/backslash/covid19, where we have all of our uh, COVID19 information. Uh, you know, most health systems have a resource like this and uh, they can help you, uh, they have decision trees uh, and they can help you keep up with uh, the, the newest guidance. Uh, the important thing not to do is uh, get your information uh, from a non-reputable source. We, ha we have to turn off the misinformation. We have all kinds of people and it, it's totally understandable. And, and as a physician, I see people misled about healthcare things all the time. Um, but we've got to get high quality information to people and we've got to get people to turn off the, the social media and the non-reputable sources of information. It may sound like what you want to hear, but unless it comes from an authoritative source, it's probably not the truth. That's why we're so grateful to have you on the show today to, the, <laughs> to dispel some of those myths and information. So, and you were saying at the top, some of the most important information, but what would be some other important messages? that you want to say to viewers that would be watching this interview? You know, over these years of taking care of, of COVID patients, you know, I wish everyone could see what I see and, and they could, you know, experience the stories and, and work with the people because there's, there's tremendous heroics happening, uh, but there's also absolutely great tragedy. And 
if I could tell people one thing, it's, it's that you do not want to spread this disease to your friends, or your family, or your neighbors. I know you don't, because nobody does. And I have to unfortunately work with families who are reckoning with this, who have a loved one who's, who's horribly ill, and, and it's very difficult. You know, so we have a pandemic right now that is preventable if we stop the spread of it. And I want to help everybody do everything they can to work as a team and, and do the right things to stop the spread. Um, you know, if we work together, that will happen. Uh, but we, <laughs> we spend a lot of time arguing about the details and, and maybe missing the point. It is really bad to just spread a disease like this. We don't have to do it if we work together. So I'm always struggling to figure out how can, how can my, the folks on my healthcare team who, who have been working like an amazing team for the last few years, help inspire the rest of the community to work like a team too. Because if we do that, uh, everything will be fine. I know with um, our family's all vaccinated and that, but you know, I worry about my um, two-year-old granddaughter, you know, about her risk. And we try to minimize that, keeping them, distance and wearing masks whenever possible and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. And children, you know, now fortunately we're able to vaccinate and boost more children. Uh, but but they're, you know, they, they can't pick this stuff. It's it's not their choice that they're children. It's it's not that their choice that uh, they, they go to school. Uh, and, and, you know, they're our future. So that's a, you, you hit a special place in my heart. I've, I've done a lot of pediatrics uh, in my career and, and we really need to do everything we can to protect kids. You know, you hear a lot right now about schools closing and, um, you know, the controversy around that and the benefits of having in-person school are undeniable. Um, but, you know, I think people get a sense that this is, this is inevitable, that, that uh, COVID is going to sweep through and, and decimate the school, uh, school's ability to, to stay in session. The reality is there's a school in St. Paul that last week had zero cases of COVID amongst their students. Uh, and that school did all the right things. Uh, they, they protected their kids by having good ventilation, good masking, a really high rate of, of vaccination and having kids stay home if they're sick. So it is possible uh, to keep schools in session and to keep our kids safe at the same time it takes a lot of work and a lot of, a lot of uh, determination, but I, it's worth it. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. Let 211 be your guiding light for help with food, healthcare, and other resources. 211, how can I help you? Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. You might be surprised to learn that cancer is the leading cause of death for children and adolescents around the world. Joining us, we're very pleased to have with us Meredith Spector to talk about childhood cancer and why one service group is raising awareness about it. So Meredith, so glad, glad to have you with us. First time on the show, so thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It's an exciting topic for me. I think people might be surprised by that stat that you know it's a leading cause of death for children. What would be some other facts that we might not be aware of with childhood cancer? Well, I wonder if I might unpack your first statement just a little bit. It is a leading cause of death in children, but not around the world. It is the leading cause of death by illness, whereas if you look at death in children, the leading cause might be accidents, and then the leading cause by illness or disease illness. would be, yes. And it, that may not be true anywhere but the United States because in some developing countries, let's just pull out of the hat, dysentery might be the leading cause of death. As it used to be here in this country, <laughs> decades, <laughs> generations ago. So what would be some of the most common childhood cancers? There are three types that are common, but there are many varieties of childhood cancers. And childhood cancers, uh, as you know, um, when you're talking about cancers, are an abnormal growth of cells anywhere in the body. But in a, in a child, 
or let's say a fetus or in a child under the age of 14 or in some cases 19 um, has can develop cancer anywhere in its body but it's a growing body so the cancers are different and they're treated differently but the most common variety in the United States and in Minnesota is leukemia followed by brain tumors and then lymphomas which are blood and uh, fluid um, types of cancers so they're not solid tumors but in the brain cancer that's a solid tumor and what do we know about those cancers <laughs> there is a little bit that we should know about that about 28 percent of all cancers in children childhood cancer is leukemia there are different categories of leukemia so that may be different for which type that you choose and since I'm not a doctor I'm not going to tell you about each of those types but brain cancer is approximately 19% of all the diagnoses of childhood cancer and another 12% is for lymphoma but there are um, other smaller categories of cancers in children including rhabdomyolysis which is has to do with the muscles it, there are sarcomas which have to do with soft tissue and joint um, and bones and then there are um, cancers of the eye for for children and many different types that you've not heard of and they are very rare fortunately and I understand um, you're with one of the local Lions Clubs and that Lions Clubs are trying to bring awareness to childhood cancer and why is that and just a little briefly about Lions Clubs for people may not be familiar with what yes. they are today yeah Lions Clubs are a volunteer service organization in fact Lions C Clubs internationally are the largest volunteer service organization in the world and so they provide um, focus areas to look at um, for the whole world to look at and and the power of numbers can can affect an outcome that is positive so one of the focus areas for Lions Clubs International is childhood cancer and and why do they know why <laughs> there are lots of reasons um, they are there is a disparity between first world and developing countries and uh, they are trying to narrow that gap so they can do that by other service opportunities which is funding uh, providing technical equipment um, putting some uh, service on the ground or feet on the ground somewhere to help people in and in some cases they are actually doing very similar things here so the childhood cancer can be uh, there are grants that the Lions Club International can give to people who write applications for projects that they can't afford locally and what would be some of those other ways that the Lions Clubs are impacting helping um, to bring awareness but also to make a difference with childhood cancer the awareness part is up to every individual club to determine how they do that okay. but one of the things that they could do is to support a family um, a family who is going through cancer uh, has not just the child who has cancer but all of the people who are caregivers are really spending a lot of focus in places that maybe they don't have enough time to focus on the other arena in their lives so we could step in as people who really aren't scientists or surgeons and provide some support for that family that is physical transporting them other children uh, helping the other children with their homework or uh, perhaps buying a piece of equipment that the, the child mm -hmm. does need something that is on a local level is one one way of doing that I could speak a little bit more about that yeah. later the other thing is that the the position of providing awareness is a service and I'd like to talk about that a little bit because my Lions Club is providing awareness by putting a display at the local library and that is because not very many people think about childhood cancer they think about breast cancer lung cancer colorectal cancer and prostate cancer 
which are the four most common cancers in the world of cancer. But only maybe one to four percent of all cancers are happen in children. So no one talks about the fact how that, how that impacts the world of childhood cancer. The problem is that if you don't have very many uh, people diagnosed with that, the impact is small if you put a lot of money into research unless or a lot of money into developing therapies. Unless or a, it's your child or your family. Unless, and that, that person means the world to yes. you. That's correct. So that's one reason. Lions are often um, quoted as being where there's a need, there's a lion. So there's a need to bring awareness to childhood cancer because they need more money, they need to get the next step um, in the, the, the therapeutics that get to uh, targeting uh, protocols for treatment. And they need to get to the next step where that child is going beyond treatment that they have and has survived. And they need, they're beginning to find out now that the survivors most of the time don't come out healthy. They may come with some risk factors that, that need to be followed forever. I'm afraid, we're, I'm afraid we're out of time already, but just quickly, people can contact the Lions Clubs if they want more information. And um, there's a special day coming up in February. There so is there is a special day, and that is International Childhood Cancer Awareness Day. That's on February 15th. And so we are providing our display at the local library then. The month of September is also Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. And our club partners with an organization called Children's Cancer Research Fund and rides in the Great Cycle Challenge, which is a fundraising uh, opportunity for uh, supplying money to researchers. Well, it's a great thing that you guys are doing. So There's one more thing that I'd like to say. Very that, quickly. Yes, Minnesota also has, Minnesota Lions also has a childhood cancer research, a childhood cancer foundation, so that the Lions in Minnesota are focused on raising money and giving away money for childhood cancer research. Well, Meredith, a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Great information. You're very welcome. <laughs> And coming up next, we're going to talk with a dietitian about some ways to get healthy in this new year. So stay with us. Owen, when you came into my life, it was a whirlwind. I just can't do it. We didn't know what the future would hold, but we knew you would always be a part of it. Adopting you was the best decision in our life. And I am so proud to call you my son. It's that time of year when many of us are looking for ways to get healthy in the new year. Joining us by Zoom is Megan Green, a registered dietitian with Launch My Health, with some tips for you. She says the key to being healthy is in our gut. Here's Megan Green. Our gut health is so important for all of our health because it's very connected to every system in our body. And so um, when we say gut, sometimes people will say, what does that actually mean? You know, And that's our full gastrointestinal system. So starting with our mouth, when we're digesting food and chewing food, and then all the way down to when we eliminate food from our body or the, the, excess, the byproducts of food and the digested parts, right? And so um, it's super important because it's really the gateway to our health. About 80% of our immune system is housed in our gut, actually. So it affects our immune function and we're all thinking about that right now. And then it also our gut has its own um, nervous system. It's called the enteric nervous system. And so there are uh, neurotransmitters that are uh, produced in the gut. So it affects our mood, our cognition, our um, just our energy levels too. So it really impacts every system and we're still learning more and more. So what would be some of those other benefits, health benefits to a healthy gut? You mentioned a little bit briefly just a second ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, there's so many of them really, but so of course for our mood and um, how our brain's functioning, 
Serotonin is a feel good um, neurotransmitter that's produced mainly in our gut. A lot of the time we think that's produced more in our brain. And if we think about, you know, like depression or anxiety and different medications that are used, well, those are great too, but we can also help enhance that um, by fixing our gut or making sure our gut's functioning well. Um, another thing is for nutrient production and nutrient absorption, uh, which we know is so beneficial because every process in our body needs certain vitamins and minerals to happen and function well. And so um, if our gut's functioning well, we're going to get those vitamins and minerals and be able to support our health and then hopefully even have optimal health, feel our best and function our best. Um, and then also for things like, like symptoms like joint pain or autoimmune conditions for our metabolism, for our cardiovascular health, um, the list really goes on and on. Because when we're getting those nutrients, that's going to help. And then when our gut's functioning well, that's going to make sure that we're, we're getting those nutrients into the right spots. What would be some of those top five things that you would recommend to someone they're starting out this new year, so how do they get their gut healthy? What would be some things that they could be doing? Yeah, so top five. So the first one I would say is if you have any you know, gut or digestive symptom, not necessarily every gut symptom has to be with digestion, but that's kind of what we think of. So say that you have constipation or kind of bloating all the time after eating, or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's feeling like urgency to go to the bathroom. Just any symptom like that, especially, I would track what you're eating and track any symptoms and then see if you can identify any patterns. So that's tip number one. And you could really do that just for awareness because whenever we make change, we wanna have, we need awareness of what we're actually doing right now and what's going on, right? So kind of centering in and getting in tune with our body. Our body's our biggest sensor, so we wanna listen to it. It's gonna tell us if something's, not really going well, right? Um, but sometimes we're not always listening to it. We're go, 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 go. <laughs> so that will tell us uh, number one. And then number two is mindful eating. So we're not even getting to what to eat yet, but number two is just to slow down when you eat. Um, and so it's a little different for everyone, but again, sometimes we can be on the go, need to get something done. I know I found myself eating at my desk and I'm like, wait, how did I get here? Wait, I'm, sp <laughs> I'm supposed to be mindfully eating. I had to take a break. Um, and so what that means and how you can do that is just sitting down to eat, taking a few deep breaths, you know, even like hands on the rib cage or belly and just feeling yourself breathing. So you can get into that parasympathetic nervous system or our rest and digest system. So sit down to eat, deep breathe, and then chew your food. You wanna just chew the food 30 times each bite is one of the, the tips. And so um, that's how you can get started with mindful eating, just kind of taking in all the senses and tasting the food. It's gonna really help with digestion because you're chewing your food well in your mouth before it even gets even further. So that's number two. Number three is getting fiber at every meal. And uh, well, fiber comes from plant foods. It's the skeleton of plant foods. So uh, vegetables, of course, right? Here it is, a dietitian telling you to eat vegetables, not a surprise. Fruits, um, nuts and seeds, chia seeds, ground flax seeds are so beneficial for many reasons. Um, what else? Just a variety of nuts. Oh, avocado is often surprising to people. That's a good one for fiber. So you wanna have fiber at every meal. That's number three. And then number four is getting those probiotics and prebiotics. And uh, probiotics are from fermented foods. So that would be things like yogurt and uh, kombucha is a fermented tea, miso, tempeh, uh, different soy options. So that would be a way to get those probiotic bacteria as well. Um, and then uh, number five is staying hydrated. So making sure you're getting enough water. It always comes back to that basic thing, but if you're eating fiber, not getting enough water, that's not gonna be helpful for gut health and function. 
Well, great tips there. So any examples of something that's worked for somebody that you, when you, you have hundreds of clients, what has worked for them? <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing is everybody's different. And so um, that's the first thing to actually kind of note is that your body is unique and your health history is unique. And there's many things that affect gut function. It's actually super affected by its environment. So uh, things that you're eating, how you're moving, stress, medications, um, toxins, things like that. So I just will say that everybody's a little different, but uh, usually when we do uh, different food, like elimination protocols and different anti-inflammatory food plans, it's really fun to see people be able to um, take control of their symptoms, kind of identify which foods are contributing to, you know, whether it's low energy or joint pain or headaches or migraines. Um, and so I have seen that a lot with my clients over the years is um, functional medicine and nutrition helps them identify certain factors of, of what's going on in their body. And they have more control over that and they can feel better and kind of um, figure out, you know, what's going to really help them feel their best. So, and this is something that you can do with uh, launch my health. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it and um, the kind of services that you offer? Yeah. So launch my health. We are a team. Uh, it's myself. Uh, I'm a dietitian and then chef Jeremy is our culinary expert and we offer virtual services. We do virtual cooking classes and nutrition classes group programs. Uh, we have our nutrition detox starting soon. And then I also do virtual private nutrition consults. So, um, you know, everybody, some people love a group aspect and some people love the private aspect. And so we, we offer that all. And it's online phone and video chat, sort of the atmosphere. Exactly. And then, yep. And I understand you're offering some complimentary consultation as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So that's how we start out really for, um, especially if you're interested in a nutrition program, I like to meet with you first for a complimentary consult. It's either a phone call or a video call. It's 15 to 30 minutes. You know, um, it's just to find out what's really going on with you and then to uh, make sure that we get you signed up for the right program or service or to see if it's even a good fit and to make sure that we can help um, help you. So yes, you can do a complimentary consult to start. And information, how they would get that information on your online there? Yes. Yep. So it's www.launchmyhealth.com. Yeah. I know final advice for our viewers that might be watching, like how they can get started in this new year and getting a healthy gut. Oh, final advice. Um, I'd say start simple, like start simple and be consistent. You know, uh, it can be tempting to, to kind of do an all or nothing approach and that's not sustainable in the long term. And so if you know you're an all or nothing person, especially note that, um, but just start with one or two actions and be consistent with them. And over time, you'll probably notice a difference and kind of see, see what you find because they can really make big, big differences, even with the small, simple changes. So. Well, Megan Green, a pleasure to have you on Inside Healthcare. Glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. And have a healthy year. You know, healthy. Thanks. Yeah. You too. Thanks. Happy New Thanks. Year. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's our program for you. Thank you for joining us. Stay healthy in the new year, everyone.